Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's 10 a.m., so I guess we are going to start this uh, webinar about Grasshopper and uh, the connection with SIA Engineer. I hope everybody can uh, can hear me. Uh, and before we get started, maybe a few uh, technical technical stuff. Uh, we are in this go to webinar tool, uh, and you can ask questions uh, in the question box on the right hand side. Uh, we are going to be with quite a lot of people, so uh, I think that is better to ask your questions instead of using your microphone. And later on, this will also be available on our YouTube channel uh, for you to replay, uh, or if you can't attend this full uh, webinar, you can always rewatch it afterwards on, on YouTube. All right. Um, so why this webinar? Uh, we see lately a, a quite a rise in questions about Grasshopper and our Koala tool, which is the tool to connect with SIA. Uh, and, and basically all of those questions were about how to get started, how to set up a parametric uh, project <clears throat> and how to connect it with SIA engineer. So pretty basic questions in general, because uh, most people, they, they get to know the parametric modeling themselves. So that's not something we have to go uh, and dig into. It's mostly about how to set it up. Uh, and so that's also what we are going to talk about today. Uh, before doing that, I'm going to give you a small introduction for people who might not be familiar with parametric design or modeling. Uh, so what is parametric design? Well, basically, if you do a standard analytical model, you start from scratch. Yeah? You build uh, several nodes, you connect them to make beams, uh, and, and you copy a few elements to get a, get a structure. With parametric design, it's totally different uh, because everything that you creates is parameterized. Uh, so that means, uh, for example, a node has uh, an X, a Y, and a Z coordinate. You can attach that to a parameter. Uh, and so if you do it that way and you build your whole model in, with that uh, principle, uh, when you end up with a certain model, it's very easy to adjust uh, the parameters and get a totally different structure. Uh, that's one benefit of doing it uh, in a parametric way. Um, and there are several other benefits uh, because if you uh, build up a parametric model, you can use the results of the calculation to do an optimization. Uh, so, uh, for example, on the left-hand side, we have a few parameters, which gives you this um, structure on the right-hand side. Um, <clears throat> but maybe if, if, the, um, if this canopy would be like two meters higher, the results would be way better. So what we can do is we can do a calculation and look at the stresses, for example, and then use these stresses to optimize the parameters on the left-hand side to, to get a very uh, yeah, good structure, a structure with, with low uh, material amounts, uh, so to say. And maybe a last uh, advantage of using a parametric model is that you can make very special uh, shapes, so to say, very architectural uh, and, and fluent uh, designs. And that's also something you can do with uh, a parametric model. Okay, so why and how do we do that? Uh, we, we use the tool called Grasshopper. It's the most popular tool used by structural engineers. And the reason is because you don't have to know programming. Uh, you, can, you can make a model by, by making scripts, uh, by programming stuff. But if you use Grasshopper, that's not necessary because it works on a, more than a visual way. You, you connect different uh, inputs with different outputs, etc. And that's very user friendly. You don't have to know anything about programming to make a parametric model if you use Grasshopper. And there's also a huge community. Uh, there, are, there are people that know um, scripting uh, and that know how to write Python scripts, for example. And those people can also add uh, add-ons into Grasshopper, which are mostly free to use on, on, on the Grasshopper platform. Um, and, and we also created this, this add-on, uh, which is called Koala. And this is basically uh, to connect Grasshopper or an analytical uh, model you make in Grasshopper with a SIA engineer. <clears throat> So the way we have set it up is uh, we basically do a automated way uh, of a batch analysis. Uh, some of you might know that you can do a batch analysis in CI Engineer. And the way it works is that uh, you have to create an empty template file in CIA. So that's going to be a .esa file. 
Uh, and in that empty file, you put an engineering report with whatever result you want to know in the end. <clears throat> um, and then uh, in some way, you have to create an XML file, which is actually a document which contains information about your analytical model. And we update this template file with this XML file so that you get uh, an analytical model. And then what we do is we do a batch anal analysis. We run uh, yeah, a finite element calculation in the background, and we update the engineering report that was in the template uh, file. And then you can use these results um, yeah, to optimize your XML or your structure. And this is basically also what we do in the Koala tool. Um, the only difference is that, that now this XML file, it gets created with our Koala tool. So you build a whole model in Grasshopper. Uh, this is going to generate an XML file. And then we, we need a template, fi template file to update the XML with. And that's a bit of the workflow we use uh, in our uh, whole setup. So that was a little bit of brief introduction on, on how it works and why we do it. But I suggest we just um, go and look at it, how it works in Grasshopper and SIA. Uh, so let's do that right away. Um, before doing that, maybe um, a little bit of an, of an explanation how you install Koala. <clears throat> this is a, a free tool you can simply download from the website. So if you go to SIA.net and go to support and services, um, if you scroll a little bit down, you can find our community add-ons. And Koala is also one of those add-ons. So it's simply free to download from our website all the way at the bottom. And what's also interesting is that you can download the source code. So if you want, you can manipulate or make adjustments in this Koala tool for your own uh, purpose of your company. But here on the left-hand side, you can download it. And the installation is simply copying these files into the Grasshopper uh, add-on location. So by default, it should be this location. It's going to be in your user folder. And my case, it's called Martijn because that's my name. Um, but it's going to be in your user folder under the Grasshopper libraries. Maybe also a small tip, because um, some of you might already uh, have some installation problems. Uh, and mostly the reason is that these files are blocked when they are downloaded. So what you need to do is right click and show the properties of those files. And you have to make sure that they are unblocked uh, on the bottom right of this window. And that's mostly the, the, the reason why it might not work in your case is when these files are blocked. So that's also uh, something important to have a look at. <clears throat> All right, once that is done, you can go to your uh, Rhino tool because Grasshopper actually is an add-on or it used to be an add-on of, of, of Rhinocerors, which is a drawing tool. But nowadays, Grasshopper is automatically installed when you install Rhinocerors. So the only thing you need to do is um, search for the command Grasshopper and Grasshopper will be available for you to use. All right, this Grasshopper tool looks a little bit like, like this. Uh, so it's an empty screen where you can script in, and that's also what we are going to do today. I'm also going to use this perspective window to make our structure visible all the time on the left-hand side, like this. Okay, so like I said, uh, this is a, um, a visual way of scripting. So you can add all kind of... Um, tools in here. And if, if your installation works, uh, you, you should also see this Koala tool, which is the tool I just copied into my um, add-ons folder. Um, and let me make a very simple structure and um, and let's let's convert it into a SIA model and, and try to do some analysis, because that's basically what I want to show you today. Uh, and the structure I had in mind was a simple bow structure and an upside down catenary. Uh, and for that, we need two points. So what you can do is uh, search for construct node um, or construct point. And this is basically uh, creating a point based on three coordinates. And this little instance I have here. Uh, and I'm going to use this one for the origin and another one for uh, the second point, and I'm going to start making it parametric uh, right away. So I need a slider, um, a number slider, 
and I'm going to set the min and max values from 0 to 10, for example. And I'm going to use this to change the x coordinate. And then you can see that my model turns into a parametric model right away, because with this slider, I can now decide how wide my structure is going to be. All right. So afterwards, I'm going to use these two points to create a catenary in between. So that's a, yeah, a cable-like structure, so to say. And what this needs is two points. So I connect my two points. Um, and it needs a, a length. Well, the, the minimum length of this uh, catenary is going to be yeah, the distance between these points plus a little bit extra, because if, if I make it make the length larger than the distance between these two points, I will have this catenary. Uh, so what I will do is I will use the addition to add this slider with another value, and I'm just going to copy the other slider. I'm going to use this as an input for my catenary, and now you can see I've created this catenary on the left-hand side. So if I change it to zero the length, well, actually, my length is going to be this length, five meters, which is the exact distance between the nodes. If I add a little bit more length, it's going to be a catenary, uh, like shown on the left-hand side. <clears throat> I want it to be a bow structure, not a cable-like structure, so I will change the Z uh, vector to a positive value. So I'm just going to use this uh, Z vector and make it upwards, this uh, structure. All right. I want to make this into some kind of steel structure with, with different um, parts. Um, so what I will do is I will divide this catenary and I will and turn it into separate beams. So I can use the uh, divide curve tool for that. What it needs is a curve and a amount of subdivisions. <clears throat> Again, I can use a slider for that. Um, and I'm gonna edit the minimum maximum settings again. Let's make a maximum amount of 20 subdivisions. Uh, and I'm gonna use even numbers. And the reason for that is I want to have a point load right in the middle in the end. Uh, and I will use this node in the middle uh, to do that. So that's why I only need even amount of numbers. And my minimum is gonna set going to be set to two like this all right so now i can connect this one to my number and now you can see i can divide my catenary curve into a lot of different uh beams or points at this uh at this point <clears throat> all right <clears throat> what i need now are straight lines in between the points i will use a polyline for that uh, which is this one And then I'm going to explode this polyline into separate segments, like this. So if I hide all of this now, uh, preview off, you can see that I have created a bow-like structure with different straight lines in between the nodes. And that's basically what I want. I'm, and I already have a parametric model, because if I change one of these uh, elements, this is all going to follow along. Um, so I can make a lot more subdivisions or leave it to two if I want. <clears throat> all right, so this is always the first step. You create some kind of structure and you make sure that it consists of elements that are convertible into, into SIA elements. And now I'm gonna use these segments um, to build an anal analytical model. So uh, what's very useful is you can use this panel uh, tool in Grasshopper to see what is inside this um output and you can see that this uh, uh this element contains seven or uh eight if you take into account the first index line-like curves and that's what i'm going to use to convert into beams so how does this koala tool work now the the one thing you will always need is the create xml tool this one right here it's it's underneath the second tab uh, and this is going to contain all of the um, information that you want to have in your analytical model. Um, what I suggest starting with is adding some materials, um, because that's what you typically also set in the project data. Uh, and you can use a value list for that. With a value list, you can make a tick, bo tick box, for example, or a checklist, uh, and uh, input it in this material property. Uh, and 
if you're not sure what what an input expects from you, you can always hover over it and you can see that this simply needs a string with the uh, material. So we can switch between concrete, steel and timber. So that's also what I'm gonna uh, set up in this value list. So for example, if I choose concrete, I want to throw out a string with concrete so that uh, this tool recognizes uh, that I want to set concrete as a material. And I'm gonna do the same thing for steel and for timber as well. Yep. And I can connect this material to my XML creator. And now I can simply use this as a tick box to, to enable certain materials in the model. So for example, I want to use concrete and steel in this project that I'm creating. Uh, maybe something I forgot to say is that when you install or download our Koala tool, we have a few basic examples um, in, in, in this folder that you will download. And you will see that this is also set up in this way. So uh, actually what I recommend doing is not starting from scratch like I'm doing, but always start from an example file so that you can see already a little bit how it should be set up. All right. Uh, so we, we said to our model, we need concrete and steel. Uh, what I will do now is create some sections. Um, and if I hover over these sections, uh, you can see uh, that it just uh, needs a list of cross sections. So I cannot put it in right away. I need the section library. And you can find that under libraries and it's gonna be the first one right here. So how is a, a section defined? You can see that it's defined in this way. It needs a name, it needs a form code, it needs, needs a type of cross-section, and it needs a certain material type. Um, if you don't know what the form code of a certain uh, cross-section is, you can always find that on our help, on our CIA help. If you type in form codes uh, in our help, you can see, for example, form code one are the I sections, form code two is the rectangular hollow sections, etc. So if you're not sure about the form code, you can find it on our uh, help website. Uh, I'm gonna create two simple sections. So let's use a panel for that. The first one I'm gonna call arch one, for example, and you always separate information with a semicolon. So the second thing I need was the form code. Uh, which is form code one for I-shaped cross-sections. Uh, the third thing that I need to uh, input in the model is the type of cross-section. So let's make a AGB 100, and the material is gonna be S235, for example. And let's create a, a second cross-section. <clears throat> let's name this one um, R2 semicolon form code one. Uh, let's make this one an AGB 200, and it's gonna be uh, the same material as 235, just like this. I'm gonna turn this panel into a multi-line data so that I can see what the information is per line that I'm gonna input in this sections. And then what I need to do is connect this sections uh, tool with the input of my XML uh, creator. So just like this, I created two sections for my uh, model. So now that I have, um, okay, I see that I forgot a space bar here. Let's fix that. Yep. Okay, now I'm gonna turn these lines into uh, beams. And see ya. And there you can use this beams tool under the structure tab uh, in Koala 4. Just like this. And then you can see again that we need a few uh, parameters to make such a beam. Um, and you don't need to necessarily fill in all. If you leave the layers empty, for example, see I will automatically create a, a layer for this beam and call it layer one. So it's not necessary to input all of these. <clears throat> parameters, uh, but there are there is there are a few minimum parameters needed, and as long as you don't uh, fill in the minimum amount of parameters, there's gonna be a warning box uh, above this tool. So first thing I need are curves. So I'm just gonna use my catenary lines 
to input as curves. And you can see this is the only thing that is uh, uttermost necessary to make this uh, beams tool running. Um, but obviously, I'm also going to uh, add some cross sections to these curves. And I can simply do that with a panel again. I'm going to use arc one as a start. And I created this section right here. So the only thing I need to input now is my is my name arc one. So I'm going to create a panel for that like this. And I'm going to use that as an input for the selections. The remaining parts I'm going to leave, leave as empty. The only thing I would recommend doing is uh, to set this RAM duplicate nodes to true. Um, because what, what is going to happen now for each one of these beams, see uh, this tool will create two nodes uh, and the beam in between. Uh, but whenever a node is shared with another beam, it means that it will have two node names on this location. And, and that's not what I want. I want one node name per location. So if I set this RAM duplicate nodes to true, uh, this tool will automatically delete all duplicate nodes. Uh, and that's also what I what I want in this case. And now I have to connect these nodes to my XML generator. So I will look for um, nodes, which is right here. And I'm going to connect my beams as well. And if you if you want to know how what 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 this tool exactly did, you can simply um, make a panel and connect it to the output. So as you can see. What this did was it creates a name and three coordinates of the node for each node. So that's basically what this beams tool uh, did. And it does something similar for um, the beam output. It's going to create a name, the name of the section, the type of element, and also in, in between which nodes it's going to be created. In this case, the first one is going to be created in between NB1 and NB2. And if I want to know how these nodes look like, I connect them with my nodes outputs and I can see MB1 is on the origin and MB2 has these coordinates. All right, second thing I'm going to create as far as analyt analytical elements goes is uh, boundary conditions. Um, so I'm going to make a simple node support. Uh, and this is a bit of a tricky thing. This input doesn't ask for um, nodes as such so it doesn't ask for coordinates but what you need to input are the nodes that were created before you add the support so basically this asks for the node name so what i need to do now is find out what my node names are and input the ones that i want to support on in my input so let's use this output to do something like this so what i need are just the list of node names I don't need the coordinates, and I can use the call pattern tool to get rid of the coordinates. So I'm going to input my notes, and I'm going to delete uh, each first, second, and third element in this list. Um, and I can create a um, Boolean pattern for that. So I'm going to keep my, my name, so it's going to be true in that case, and I'm going to delete the next three coordinate information. And if I do it that way, you can see I just get a list of my node names. And that's basically what I want, want because now I can choose which node I want to have support on. All right, um, this is very useful. So I'm just going to leave this right next to the node output. So if I need the node names, I can just pick them from here. Uh, and this is also what I will need to add some support. I will add supports on the first and the last node. So I'm going to just use list item to do that. I'm going to choose this list and I will choose the first item, which has index zero. And I will do that with the last item. And I can simply reverse this list so that it takes the last uh, node name as the first item. So this, this now contains, contains NB1. And this contains MB9. And I can simply input these node names into my support um, tool. What else do I need to set up in here? Well, I need to define my constraints, constraints obviously. 
Uh, and if I hover over this, you can see that um, you can input four different variables. You can set it to free, rigid, flexible, or nonlinear. Um, I'm also going to create a simple value list for this. Um, so this should work like this. If it's set to free, I will output a zero index. If it's set to rigid, it should give me a value of one. Because you can see this works a little bit different than the, than the materials. It's going to choose between these four options. So that's why I need to give it an integer instead of a name. Um, and this should also not be a, a, a checklist. This should be a, um, I was told, drop down list. I can only, only have one value uh, right here. So what I will do is I will set the displacements to fixed, which are the, well, the T, X, T, Y, and T, Z. I will fix rotation around, around X axis as well. And I will leave the rota rotations around Y and Z axis as free. So if I hover over these values, you can see that now my uh, rotation Y is set to free, rotation X set to rigid. And you can do some more stuff in here, but for this example, I'm just gonna leave it with this information. And now I need to add my node supports to my XML generator. Uh, let's see where they are, it's right here. Just like that. All right, uh, now I basically have my structure. Eh? I have my catenary with, some, with a cross section assigned and some supports defined. What I need now are some loads, obviously. Um, and firstly, I will create some load cases and load groups so that, so that, that I can put loads into those groups and load cases. Um, and the load cases are as well under the libraries tab. So I choose for Koala load cases and groups. And this works the same way as the cross sections. I simply create a panel and I have to define the load case with a name uh, the type of load case and a load group assigned. Uh, for the load groups, I also need a name, the type of load group, and the relationship of the load cases in that load group. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's make LG1, uh, LC1 for the self weight. And self weight is defined like this. And the last thing I need is the load group, where this load case is going to be in. Second load case is going to be my permanent load. So I just type permanent. This one is also going to be an LG1. And then my third load case is going to be a variable uh, load case. And then this one is going to be an LG2. And let's also turn it into a multi line data. Yep, that works. And now I also need the same thing, but for my load groups. So LG1 is gonna be um, yeah, permanent. And let's make it a standard relationship. So the last uh, property is gonna be standard, exclusive, or together. These are the settings that you can also find in CIA Engineer. Eh? So if you go to uh, load groups, uh, it's basically first you set what type of load you need. And secondly, if it is a variable load, you have to set the um, relationship. So it's going to be standard, exclusive, or together. That's basically what you set up um, in this panel. So I have my LG1 permanent, permanent standards. I have my LC2, which is going to be variable. And this is going to be a standard relationship. And I think I don't, don't even need to define a relationship for the first one because permanent is always um, standard. 
yeah, relationship. So I'm going to leave it like this. And now again, I have to connect my load cases to my load cases inputs, which is right here. And my load groups, I'm going to connect to my load groups outputs. So now that I created these load cases, I can start adding um, loads to my model. So I go to my Koala tool and under loads, let's start with a point load on a structural load, a structural node, which is this one. And again, it needs some variables. Um, it needs a load case and I created these load cases so I can simply use the same name right here. So it's gonna be an LC2, for example, because the first one is my self weight. Uh, and the same as with um, supports, I need a node list and this is not gonna be a list of structural nodes. This is gonna be the node names where I want to have these loads on. So for example, if I now want to load the, the middle node of my catenary, I have to find which, uh, which name belongs to this node. And this one, th in this case, it's easy because I know this will be the middle node. So it's gonna be the middle node name as well. Uh, but if I have more advanced structures, I'm gonna have to compare my coordinates with the coordinates in Rhinoceros and see which which one matches with the node name in my Koala tool. Um, but okay, in, in this case, I'm just gonna use the parameters I already have to see which, which node name belongs to this node. So first, let's find this node uh, from my list. Uh, and I'm gonna use the list item option to do that. And let's first search in the... Um, divide tool to see where the middle node is so you can see if i click on this select item tool you can see the first node is highlighted i need the node in the middle and this is probably going to be the uh, division length divided by two so that's what i'm going to try to do i'm going to choose for division and choose my um, count input and I'm gonna divide by two always, and I can use a panel for that. So simply set it to two, and divide by two. And this one I'm gonna use now as an input. And now you can see I've found my middle node of my catenary. And this one is gonna be always in the middle because my count a slider, it was set to even numbers. So there will always be one node right in the middle. Okay, so. I'm gonna use this now to find the middle node number and that's pretty simple because I can simply connect this output to my input of this element. And this, this should give me uh, the middle node uh, number. So if I connect it now with a panel, you can see MB5, one, two, three, four, five is gonna be the middle node. And I can use this one as my input for this um, point load tool. All right, I also need a value. I can simply again use a panel for that or I, what I can also do is use a slider. Maybe that's a better idea. Let's turn it into a number slider and set some min and max values. It's gonna be pointing downwards. So I set my minimum to minus 10 and my maximum to zero and use this as a value. So let's start with a value of minus 10, for example. Let's, let's make it a little bit larger. Minus 53 or something like that. Um, the direction is gonna be in Z direction, so I'm gonna leave that. If you want it to be in X direction, you have to set a X vector as an input. So you can simply type unit X and connect it to my uh, direction and input. But I'm gonna leave it as Z direction in this case. All right, so this needs to be connected to my point loads. Uh, input point loads are right here, point loads on point. and connect it with this output. Let's also put something in load case three. 
So I'm simply going to copy this uh, icon. All right, let's just create a new one. Uh, and let's, let's, for example, use the beam loads option. With this one, I can add line loads to a certain amount of beams. Um, and instead of um, searching for a specific beam, I want to have my uh, loads on all of my beams. So what I will do now is I will use my beams output to find the beam names, and I will use all of those beam names to put a line load on. So I can use this call pattern tool again. So I'm going to connect it to the beams out output now. And first, I have to see what the information is that my beams output uh, gives me. So in this case, I have a um, name and a lot of different um, information. So what I can do now is just use this call pattern tool to get rid of all of this um, unnecessary information. Or what I can also do in this case is simply connect the output beam to my input of my uh, load uh, beam loads tool. So I'm going to connect this beam list with my output, and this should also work. Um, so in this case, I'm going to load all of my beams with uh, these properties of the load. Um, Let's use this slider again to change the um, value. And as you know, a line load can have a yeah, an even uniform distribution, but it can also have a trapezium-shaped uh, distribution. So that's why I have two load value inputs, but I'm going to connect them to the same um, input and leave it to uniform so that I'm, that I'm sure that this value is going to be used as the line load. So let's set it to about 10, for example. Uh, and I also need a load case. So in this case, it's going to be LC3, like this. All right. And then I need to find my line loads input of my XML creator and connect it to the output. So line loads and line loads, just like this. And that's about it. Um, so I've created a structure, I created some boundary conditions, and I've created some loads. So now let's have a look at how we convert this into an XML document, and let's see if we can import it in SIA uh, Engineer. So um, to do that, first I need to give my XML document a name and a file location. And you can simply do that um, by inputting a panel in the file name. Um, input. So I'm going to use a panel for that and connect it to file name, this one. And I've created already a temp folder on my C drive. That's actually also what I recommend doing. Make a location in your C drive to put all of this information because if you go over network locations and stuff like that, this might not uh, work properly. So I'm just going to copy this location. And I'm also going to add the name. So you add a backslash, and you add the name for this uh, project. So in this case, it's going to be webinar. Webinar Koala, for example, dot XML. And now on this location, on my C drive, it will create an XML document with this name. And that's basically how it works. Um, the only thing I need to do now is I have to activate it, and that's where this input is for on demand. And what I like to do is I like to use a button for that. I'm going to use this button option and create it to the on demand input. And uh, now every time I click this button, an XML document will be generated. And what I recommend doing is I'm going to lower this view a little bit. And here in my command line, I will see if that the uh, export was successful or not. So let's hope it works straight away. And it seemed to be worked because, or it has, has worked because I can see writing to file on this location was succeeded. So if I now go and look in this folder, you can see that it created two files. 
One contains the XML um, description of my analytical model, and one contains the definition of my XML file. So these two files is what I need to build up the model in SIA. Okay, and now let's have a look uh, in SIA if it works. So I'm just gonna close all of my projects, and what I can do now is I can open from XML file and simply go and look for this XML file that I just created. So it's this one. There you go. And you can see that the structure seems to be correct. I have my uh, upside down catenary. The cross section that is assigned was this AGB 100 with name ARC1. I have three load cases, and in load case two, there should be a point load, and in load case three, there should be a line load on all beams, um, and there should be some load groups in the model, just like this. If I go to my project settings, I should also see that concrete was enabled and steel was enabled, because that's what I set up in the materials. So basically now what I can do is start working this model, uh, perform the calculation, let's see if that also runs, and do some checks on the model. Yep, so looks good. Um, I fixed my uh, rotation around X axis, so this, this bow structure will not fall over. So this is pretty much good to go. So this is one way you can use the XML uh, creator or, or Koala tool. Uh, another way is that you can also run it in a more automated way. Uh, I already explained to you in the PowerPoint presentation that basically what we do is we do a automated batch anal analysis. And that's also something I can do in my uh, Grasshopper with Koala. So basically what I need to do first is I have to create a template file. And in this template file, I need to define uh, what results I'm interested in. Uh, and this could be stresses, this could be steel code check, this could be anything that you uh, want. Uh, but this is information I have to input in my template file. And then this template file, it gets updated with the information from my XML. So what I can also do is I can put some more information in my uh, template file. For example, if I have some um, specific cross sections, uh, if I want to know a very want to make a very specific general cross section, I can already put them in my uh, in my template file. I don't know some polygon or something like that, something that looks like this. I can close it, and if I now give it a specific name, R three, for example, uh, I can use this name in my script as well because I'm going to update my template file with information from my XML. So if I do it this way, there's no reason for me that I have to define my cross sections in my script. I can also define my cross sections in my template file. All right, but that's something additional you can do with this uh, template file. What I'm gonna do now is I'm simply gonna create a new project. I'm going to enable the same materials as I did in my script. And I'm going to add an engineering report. Uh, and in this engineering report, I'm going to tell the template which information I want to know in the end. So, for example, it's going to be a steel code check. Um, this one. And I'm interested in the combination set B. So right now there's no results available um, because there's nothing in the project. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna uh, update this project with my XML information. I'm gonna run the calculation in the background and I'm gonna export this engineering report. And then I can use this information again to do some optimization routines, for example. All right, so let's do that. I'm gonna save this one as well on my C drive in the same temp folder. Um, I already had a, a template file, so let's just overwrite this one. Yeah, and this is now gonna be my template file. All right, let's close it down. Back to my grasshopper. 
So instead of opening the project manually, updating with the XML manually, I want to do this more in an automated way. And that's what you can do with the calculation or analysis tool from Koala. So let's put this one in the model. Uh, and there are, are a few inputs that are necessary to make this possible to run. Uh, the first one is the file name, and this is the file name of the XML file. So basically what you can do is simply connect the outputs of my XML to the input of my analysis. Second thing you need to do is you have to provide this uh, component with the location of your ESA XML path. And this is actually what is going to do the batch analysis. This is pretty much the calculation hard of SIA, but without, without the interface. Phase. Um, so you have to know this uh, file location. And by default, it's just going to be your installation folder. So you have to go to Program Files, SIA Engineer, and you find the latest um, version of your SIA Engineer on your PC. And it's going to be this. Uh, ESA.xml, which is going to run the uh, calculations. So I need this file location. And again, I can simply paste it in a panel component. And then I'm going to add a backslash. And I need also uh, the name of the executable. So I'm going to put in ESA.xml.x. And now uh, this tool is going to search on this location for the correct uh, ESA XML file, and this is going to be used to run the calculations. So I'm going to connect this one to this input, like that. Then I can choose the calculation type. I'm going to leave it just to linear, but if you want, you can also switch to nonlinear stability or eigenfrequency calculation. Uh, the next thing is going to be the template name, and this is the file I just created. So again, I need a file location and also the file name of my template. So back to my folder. This is going to be the file location. And I also need the file name. So let's see how I named it again. I'm just going to copy this name so that I don't make mistakes like that and input it as my template name. Also very important, and you can see that already a little bit in the naming that I used, you cannot use a, a space bar in between the words. So for example, if I, if I would make a template file that looks like this, and I put this as an input for my analysis component, this probably will not work. So that's why I recommend to you always use uh, subscores in your naming, because else your script might uh, not recognize the, the file that should be used. All right. Then what I need is my output file, and this is going to be the engineering report that is going to be exported. And I can export it as an Excel file, as a PDF document, as a Word file. And this is also what I need to tell to my analysis components. So again, first I need a location. I'm just going to use the same uh, location as I used for my template file. And let's give it the name results.xlsx. And this is going to throw me out an Excel document if I use this uh, extension. And I connect it with my output file. Um, the run is XML uh, is a Boolean. And when this is set to true, it's going to run the analysis. Um, and it's going to run that each time that this file name gets updated. So that means once I click this button, my XML document gets uh, created. This file name is going to be used as an input. And when that is done, this analysis component starts running, or it should be running uh, if I set it up properly. And the last thing I need to provide this analysis component is the saved uh, uh, SIA uh, project. So what is going to happen now, uh, the template file gets opened, which is this file. It gets updated with my XML document. The analysis gets, gets run. And after the analysis, two things happen. Um, 
the ESA file with the results is going to be saved. And also the engineering report gets exported and saved to my temp uh, location. So I'm going to use the same location again. And instead of um, this name, I'm going to also call this one results CF, for example, dot uh, ESA. And connect it to my saved saved SIA engineer project. And now hopefully this runs. Let's see what happens if I click the button now. And now you can see that this batch analysis starts to run. So what is happening now in the background is the template file gets opened. It gets updated with my XML file. And then the linear calculation starts to run in this case. At least that is how it should work. Yeah. By now, this should already give a result. So probably there's something wrong, wrong in my script. So Let's see what the problem was. Uh, okay. What you can do as well is I'm going to attach a recorder. Um, a data recorder to my message output and also to my output file and so then I can see if there were any warnings or whatsoever and see if I can find what the problem was just like this uh, let's check again maybe I should also close down my SIA So this should be correct. XML.x. Um, this is my template file. Template simple.esa. My results should be of format XLSX, if I'm not mistaken. Let's speak in my other documents. XLSX, yes. And this should be my, okay, let's try again. Not sure why it doesn't work now. Okay, now it works. So now it's running some uh, tasks in the background. Okay, it finishes, finished. And you can also see that the calculation succeeded uh, in the rhinoceros uh, command display. And now if I go into my temp folder location, you can see that a number of files uh, got added. So you can see a result uh, Excel file and also a, uh, a SIA file with the results saved. So if I go and look in my uh, Excel file now, you can see that I can, I, that I can see the overall unity check for this structure, which is 2.17 in this case. What is very useful now is I can use this information to put in my Grasshopper script and do some automations or whatever you want to do. So let's try and do that. I'm going to um, use this output, this uh, Excel file, to um, to, to read some information, and that is very useful because then I can change my parameters and immediate, immediately see what effect it has on the results. Um, so first, 
I need to re get rid of my null elements in this list. So I'm going to use this list. And then I'm going to use the curl pattern, pattern tool to remove the null elements. So I need this one as an input. Uh, this are my, these are my booleans. And let's see if it worked. Yeah, now I only have the null elements, but if I reverse my or invert my Boolean pattern, you can see that I, I'm only left with the location of my Excel file. Uh, and now I can use this together with an Excel reader to find for find the, the largest unit to check. Um, so I'm going to connect this to the path. I'm going to set my read Boolean to true. Uh, and my worksheet, I have to copy from my Excel file, obviously. So I'm going to use this worksheet, put it in a panel, and connect it to my worksheet input. And now I will be able to see some data. So if I connect my data to a panel to see what comes out of it, you can see all of the information in my Excel file is now also in my output. So if I scroll down, I can see that the um, fifth index or fifth data tree contains my overall unity check. So this is actually what I want to get out of this uh, data output. And I can, again, use my list item for that. So first connect the data output with my list, and I, I'm going to ask for the fifth data tree. So if I now connect my output, um, okay, it's, it's not the data tree that I need, but I need the uh, integer or the index. So in this case, I will need my ninth uh, value. So it should be nine in this case, if I ask for a element. Let's see if that works. Yep. So here and under my index five, I now have my highest unity check. So what I can do now is flatten this list and ask for the fifth element in this list. Just like this. Let's see if that works. Yeah. So now I have as an output my highest unity check. So let's make it a little bit uh, bigger so I can see it properly. Yep. All right, and this is very useful because now I can use this information to optimize my structure. If I go back to my beginning, uh, what I can do is I can change my uh, height, for example. I make my catenary a little bit lower. I can lower down my X coordinate. And possibly I can also choose a different cross section. So here under beams, I use the first one. Let's use the second one. And now once again, run the calculation by hitting the button. And we remember that we had a unity check of 2.18 uh, at first. And now we can immediately see what these changes in the structure mean in terms of unity check. Um, Yeah, so calculation was finished. Now let's have a look at the unity check. Okay, it didn't make much of a difference apparently. It's only 2.17 now. Um, ah, I, I think it didn't work because I had my Excel file open. So I first have to close my Excel file and try again. Yep. There he is. Yeah. And now you can see that my unity check turned into 0 0.18. And, and that, the reason is because I changed my cross section to arc 2 and I made some adjustments to the shape of my catenary.
so yeah, that's that's a little bit the power of of using this analysis tool. You get um, information directly uh, about the changements or the changements you make to the uh, parameters for the input. Um, so yeah, that's very use, useful to do an optimization. And what you can also do now is use this Unity check uh, together with the Galapagos uh, optimizer to do some more advanced optimizing or doing it more in an automatic or automated way uh, instead of manually changing the parameters. All right. Um, I see my time's up. So, and that's also basically what I wanted to show you. Uh, one last thing maybe um, is that we also give a training about this topic. topic. Um, back to my previous to last slide. So yeah, in, in any case, if you have questions, you can leave them in the chat box. I will have a look at them afterwards um, and, and answer you by mail. Um, or you can always support, um, send an email to our support, which is support at ci.net. Uh, and then one of the next few months, I'm also going to give you an in-depth training about parametric design. So what, we'll do, what we will do in that case is, is really build up a full parametric project, see all the ins and outs of all the, the icons in, in uh, Koala, uh, and, and also set up an automation uh, routine. So if you're interested in, in this topic, and maybe this webinar was a little bit too short for you, uh, I recommend to have a look at our trainings. You can find them on our website. Uh, and you can subscribe to one of our parametric modeling trainings if you want. All right, that was it for today. Uh, I would like to thank you for following this webinar, and uh, maybe I see you in uh, the future. Have a nice day. Bye.